hoping that all of you children here tonight will also enjoy Midsummer Night's Dream. And we're running about an hour and twenty, and Midsummer Night's Dream has lots of spirits in it. So all sorts of different spirits and a lot of fun and games. And that's one of Shakespeare's most happy plays you're about to see, which is, I hope, going to be a very enjoyable experience for all of you. So over to a real treasure, A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on a pace four happy moons brings in a new day, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes as she lingers my desires like to a septem or a dowager long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly seek themselves into night, four nights will quickly dream away the time. Then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven shall behold the night of our solemnity. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love doing thee injury. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation to come on, with complaints against my child, my daughter, Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. But over Lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. With cunning has he filched my daughter's heart and turned her obedience, which is due to me, into stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so, she will not, for your grace, consent to marry with me. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine. I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law, immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your duty, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax, by him imprinted and within his power. To leave the figure or disfigure it? Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is. But in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other shall be held the worthier. I would my father look, but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not but what power I am able, nor how it may concern my mind. In such a presence here to plead my thoughts, but I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in the case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to forever abjure to the society of men. Ere I will grow, so live, so die, my lord. Ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me, for everlasting bond of fellowship. Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar for, to protest for I austerity and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazed title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Scornful Lysander. True, he hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him. And she is mine, and all my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nadar's daughter Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess. I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full with self affairs, my mind did lose it. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit the fancies of your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which we may extenuate by no means to death or to a vow of single life. Come, my Hippolyta, 
What share, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Be like for want of rain, which I could well redeem them from the tempest of my eye. I need, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eye! A good persuasion, therefore hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house removed seven leagues. She respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. Into that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena, to observance to a morn of May. There will I stay for thee. Tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. He promised love. Look, here comes Helena. God speed her, Helena. Whither away? Call you me fair? That fair again unsafe. Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair, your eyes are loath stars, and your tongue sweet air more tunable than large you shepherds here. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, sickness is catching. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you win emotion of Demetrius' heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smile your skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers with such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is terrifying. None but your beauty would that faults were mine. Take comfort, he no more shall see my face. My dinner and myself will fly this place. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, to Athens' pace, have we devised to steal. And in the wood, where often you and I Upon these primrose beds where won't to lie, emptied our bosom of their comfort plea, there Lysander and myself shall be. And then from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friend and strange companion. Farewell, sweet fellow, and pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Be poor Lysander, we must starve our sight from lovers till tomorrow to midnight. I will, my Hermia. Helena, adieu. As you on him, Demetrius dote on you. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am bought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he doth know. And as he errs doting on Hermia's eyes, so I admiring of his quality. Things base and vile holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Nor hath love finds any judgment taste, wings and no eyes figure unseeing hate. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is often beguiled, as waggish boys and game themselves forswear, so the boy love is murdered everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyes, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this tale from he from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her, and for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense, but here in me night to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Is all our company here? We're best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit for all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quinn, stay with the play tree on, then read the names of the actors, and so grow on to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Pity. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and a Mary. Now, good Peter Quint, call forth your actors by the scroll. Master, spread yourself. Answer as I call you, Nick Bottom, the Weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for, and proceed. 
do Nick Bottom her set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? It is a lover who kills himself most terribly <laughs> for love. Then we'll ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. For the rest, yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Heracles rarely, or impart to Terracotta to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus' car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fate. <laughs> this was law. Now name the rest of the players. Yes! That was Heracles' vein. A tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Dear Peter Quinn, you must take Bisbee Island. What is Bisbee? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. <laughs> Nay, face, let not me play a woman. I have a beard coming. That's all one. <laughs> you shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. Well, and I may hide my face. Let me play Bisbee too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. The Fizney, Fizney. <laughs> ah, Pyramus, my lover dear, thy Fizby dear and lady dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus and flute, you Fizby. Well, proceed. <laughs> Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Peter Quinn. Robin Starveling, you must play Fizby's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quinn. You, Pyramus's father. Myself, Fisbee's father, Snug the Joiner, you, uh, the lion's part, and I hope there is a play. Okay, well, have you the lion's part written? I just pray you, if it be, give it me, for I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roar. Well, let me play the lion, too. I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will say, that the Duke will say, Let him roar again! Let him roar again! You should do it too terribly. You would frighten the Duchess and the ladies that, that they would treat. And that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us every mother's son. But, masters, here are your parts. And I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to come by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood a mile out the town by moonlight. There we will rehearse. For if we shall meet in the city, we shall be dogged with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw bills of property such as our play wine. I pray you fail me not. We will meet, and there we may rehearse more obscenely and courageously. Take pain, be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's Oak, we meet. Over at Titania had a great row. The row was so huge it broke every bow. The king of fairies was sleeping around, but Titania also was out on the prowl. The changeling boy both wanted to possess, but they had different views, so it was a great mess. Was over on the dad? Nobody knows. He thinks he was, but that's how it goes. This argument has a serious side. The climate changed the whole world wide. The moon and the tide went all askew, all because a human over on screwed. <laughs> Ill met by moonlight, Titania. What? Jealous over on. Fairy skipped hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Harry, rash wanton, and not I thy lord. Then I must be thy lady. But I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and in the shape of corn sat all day, playing on pipes of corn and bursting love to amorous Philida. Why art thou here? Come from the farthest steps of India? <laughs> but that forsooth the bed bouncing Amazon, your buskin mistress and your warrior love to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity? Oh. Well, go thy way, but thou shalt not from this grove fly torment me for this injury. My gentle pot, come hither. Fetch me that flower, that herb I showed thee once, 
the juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me that flower and be thou here again. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep, and then I'll drop the liquor of it in her eyes, and the next thing she waking looks upon, be it lion or bear or wolf or bull on meddling monkey or busy ape. Oh, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible, and I will overhear their conference. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is my sister and fair Hermia? The one I'll stay, the other stayeth me. Thou told'st me they were stolen within this wood. And here I am, and wooed within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, yet to draw not iron. For my heart is to its steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather do I not, in plainest truth, tell you I do not, nor I cannot, love you? And even for that do I love thee the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me as your spaniel. Burn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me, only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. What worse or place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you do use your dog? Have not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on me. And I am sick when I look not on you. I will not say thy questions. Let me go. Or if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. I'll follow thee and make a heaven out of hell to die upon the hand I love so well. Fare thee well, miss. Ere he do leave this robe, thou shalt fly him and he shall seek thy love. Oh, hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Aye, there it is. I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where the oxlips and the nodding violets grows, quite over canopy with luscious wood vine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There lies Titania, some time of the night, mauled with these flowers with dances and delight, and there that snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. There I will take this juice of hers and streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. I'll take out some of it and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do so when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on, and affected with some care that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. Come, now a roundel and a fairy song. Then for the third part of a minute, hence. Some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds. Some war on rare mice for leaven wings to make my small elves coat. And some keep back the clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wonders <coughs> at our quaint spirit. Sing me asleep, then to your offices, and let me rest. You spotted snake with double tongue, thorny hedgehog, be not seen. Newt nor blindworm, do no wrong. Come not near our fairy queen. Mellow in melody, sing in our sweet lullaby. La 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 bye. La 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 bye. Never harm nor spell nor charm. Come our lovely lady night. So good night with lullaby. Weaving spiders come not here. Hence you long like spinner. Hence beetles black approach not here. Worm nor snail do no offense. Now all is well. <laughs> Would thou?
thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take, love in language for his sake, in thy eye that shall appear, be it ounce or cat or bear, pard or boar with bristled hair, wake when some vile thing is near. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood, and to speak troth, I have forgot our way. Well, rest up, Hermia, you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander, find you out of bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head. One turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One heart, one soul, two bosoms, and one throat. Naked Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet, do not lie so near. Oh, take the sense, sweet, of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchanged with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single trope. Then, by your side, no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. Lysander riddled very prettily. Not much be true my manners and my pride. Amen, amen, to that fair prayer say I, and end, loyal, and end life when I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Sleep, give thee all his breath. Which hath that which the wicked eyes compress. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none, on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force and stirring love. Night and silence. Who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. Oh, this is he, my master said, the spies of the Athenian maid. And here the maiden, sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul, she durst not lie near this black love, this ill courtesy. Churl, upon my eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wake, let love forbid to leave a seat on his island. Shall awake when I am gone, for I must now do Oberon. Day, though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus. <sighs> oh, wilt thou darkling leave me? Do not so. Stay, on thy peril. I alone will go. Oh, I am out of breath in this bond's chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. No, no, I am ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away for fear. But who is here? Lysander, on the ground, dead, or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. And run through fire I will for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena, nature shows her art, set through thy bosom, makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword! Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What, though he love your Hermia? What, though? Yet Hermia still loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? No, I do repent. The tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena, now I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? Wherefore was I to this king mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve such scorn? It's not enough, it's not enough, young man, that I did never know nor never can deserve a sweet look from Demetrius' eyes. But you must flout my insufficiency. Good troth, you do me wrong. Good sooth, you do in such disdainful manner me to woo. But fare you well, perforce I must confess, I thought you lord of more true gentlemen. Oh, how a lady of one man refused should of another therefore be abused. She sees not Hermia, Hermia sleep thou there, and never mayst thou come Lysander near, and all my powers address your love and might to honor Helen and to be her knight. Help me, Lysander, help me. Do thy best to put this bra 
falling serpent from my breast. Try me, for pity, what a dream was here. Oh, Lysander, look how I do quake with fear. Methought serpent ate my heart away, and you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander! What removed? Lysander! Lord! Without a hearing. Gone? No sound? No word? Alas, where are you? Sound of you here. Out of all love, I swooned almost with fear. No? Because then I perceive you are not nigh. Neither death or you I'll find immediately. Are we all met? And here's a marvelous, convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This Hawthorne breaks our tiring house, and we will do it in action as we would do it before the Duke. Peter Quinn. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How is he that? Fire like it, a parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a wish. I have a device to make all well. <laughs> Write me a prologue. And let that prologue seem to say that we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed in need. And for the more better, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but I am Bottom the Weaver. This should put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight and six. No, no, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be appeared of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Master, you ought to consider with yourself to bring in God shield us. A lion among ladies is the most dreadful thing. There is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, a prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck, and he must speak through, saying thus or to the same effect. Uh, ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would entreat you, or I would request you not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. I am no such thing. I am a man as other men are. And let him name his name, and tell them plainly he is not the joiner. Well, it shall be so. But there is two hard things. That is, to bring moonlight into the chamber, for you know, here Mr. Thisbe is me by moonlight. Does the moon shine the night we play our play? A calendar! A calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out moonshine! Find out moonshine! Yes, it, it does shine that night. Why, then we may leave a casement of the great chamber where we play open, and the moon may shine in at the casement! Aye! Or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern and say he come to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for here Mrs. Thisbe says the story to talk through the shape of a wall. <laughs> you can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall. And let him have some loam or some plaster or some rough cast about him to signify wall. And let him hold his fingers thus, and through that cranny shall hear Mrs. Thisbe whisper. <laughs> that may be, and all is well. Come, sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your part. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so every one according to you. What hath been homespun have we swaggering here? Go near the cradle of the fairy queen. What? A play toward? I'll be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Speech, Pyramus. Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savor sweet. Odors. Odors. Odors savor sweet. So hath thy breath, thy dearest Thisbe, here. But hark, a voice. Stay thou but here a while, and by and by to thee I will appear. A stranger pyramus than e'er played here. Must I speak now? Ay, Mary, must you. You must understand 
He goes to deceive a noisy bird, and is to come again. Most radiant pyramids, most lily white of hue, of color like the red rose on triumphant friar, most brisky juvenile, and each most lovely too, of the truest, truest horse that yet would never tire, I'll meet thee, pyramids, at Ninny's too. Sinus is too mad! Why, you must not speak that yet! That you answer to Pyramus. Speak all your parts at once. Cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is passed. It is never tired. Oh! As true as true as horse, I yet would never tire. If I were fair, this be I were only thine. Oh, monstrous! Oh, strange! We are haunted! Pray, masters! Fly, masters! Help! I'll follow you! I'll lead you about the round! Through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar! Sometimes a horse I'll be, sometimes a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometimes the fire! And neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn! Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me a fear! Oh, bottom, thou art changed! What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? <gasps> Bless thee, bottom. Bless thee. Thou art translated. <laughs> I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me. To fright me, if they could. But I will not stir from this place to do what they can. I will walk up and down, that I, and I will sing, so that they will know I am not afraid. Well, 
that cowardly giant like Oxy hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you, your kindred hath made my eye water ere now. I shall desire you of more acquaintance too, good master must proceed. Come, wait upon him, lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my lover's tongue, bring him silently. I wonder if Titania be awake, then what it was next that came into her eye, which she must dote on in extremity. Oh, here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night will now about this haunted grove? My mistress, with a monster, is in love. <laughs> there to her close and constant bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of catches, rude mechanicals, that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus' nuptial day. The shallowest, thick skin of that bear and sword, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, an ass's knoll I fixed it on his head. When in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked and straightway loved an ass. This falls out better than I could have devised. Mm. But has thou left the Athenian eyes with the love juice as I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, that is finished too, and the Athenian woman by his side, that when he wakes, of course she must be eyed. Oh, dead close. This is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. <laughs> oh, why rebuke you, him that loved you so, lay breath so bitter on thy bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I could use thee worse, for thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, be an or shoes and blood, put in the deep, and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon as this whole <laughs> earth may be born, and that the moon may through the censer creep and so displease her brother's noontide with the antiphony. It cannot be but thou hast murdered, murdered him, so should a murderer look, so dead, so grim. <laughs> so should the murdered look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, looks as bright, as clear, as Yonder Venus in her glimmering spear. What's this with Lysander? Where is he? My good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I would rather give his carcass to my house. Out, dog, out, cur! You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could... What should I get there for, huh? Oh, uh, have you yet to see me more? And from thy hated presence part I so? See me no more, whether he be dead or no. There is no falling her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while, I will remain. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love sight. Of go about the wood. Swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens, look thou find. All fancy sick she is, and pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. Go through this wood, and look her here. I will charm his eyes against she doth appear. I go, I go, look how I go. Swifter than arrow from the Tartar's bow. Flower of this purple dye, hitch with Cupid's archer eyes, sink an apple of his eyes. When his love he doth espy, let her shine as gloriously as Venus of the sky. When his love he doth espy, beg of her for remedy. Captain of our fairy band, Helena is here at hand, and the youth miscombined me, pleading for a lover's fee. Shall we their fond pageant see? Lord, what fools these mortals be. Stand aside, the noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. <laughs> that at once will two woo one. That must needs be sport alone. 
And these things do best please me that befall preposterously. Why should you think I rule in scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look when I vow. I weep and vow so far in their nativity all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, you know. oh, devilish holy fray, these vows are Hermia's. Will you give her or? Wait oath with oath, and you will nothing weigh. Your vow to her and me in two scales will even weigh, and both as light as pale. I had no judgment, but to her I swore. Nor not in my mind, now you give her or. Demetrius loves her, and he you. <coughs> oh! Helen, goddess, nymph, divine, to what, my love, shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how bright it shows thy lips, those kissing, cherry tempting growth, that pure, congealed, white high Tara snow, fan with the eastern wind, turns to a crow. When thou holdst up thy hand, oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. Oh, spite! Oh, hell, now I see you are all bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not taste me, as I know you do, but you must join in soul to mock me too? If you were men, as men you utter and show, you would not use a gentle lady so, to bow and swear and super praise my part, when I am sure you hate me with your heart. You both are rivals, and love Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena. A trim exploit, a manly exercise, to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience, all to make you sport. You are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so, for you love Hermia. This you know, I know. And here, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I yield you up my part and yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love, and will do to my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander, keep thy herb. I will not. If, uh, if I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her, but as a guest wife sojourn, and now to Helen it is home return. There to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know. Lest to thy peril thou abide dear. Look, where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. <laughs> thou art not by my eye, Lysander, found. My ear, I think, is lucky to thy song. But why on silence dost thou leave me so? Why should he stay who love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love that would not let him by. Fair Helena. Who more in guilt tonight than all yon fiery oaths and eyes of light? Why seek'st thou me? Could not this make thee know the hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think, it cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have sling all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared, the sister's vows, the hours that we have spent, when we have chased the hasty footed time for parting us? Oh, is all forgot? All school days, friendship, childhood, innocence? It is not friendly, it is not maidenly. Our sex, as well as I, may chide you for, though I alone do feel the injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and praise my eyes and face? And make your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph, divine and rare, precious celestial? Wherefore speak to this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul and tender me for spilt affection? But by your setting on, by your consent, what, though I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most, to 
to love unloved. This you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. I do. Persever. Counterfeit sad look. Make mouths upon me when I turn my back. Wink at each other. Hold the sweet jest up. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. If you knew any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare you well. Tis partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. Stay, gentle Helena. Hear my excuse. My love. My life, my soul, bear Helena. Oh, excellent! Please, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. <laughs> Thou canst compel no more than she entreats. Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee by my life, I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee. To prove him false that says I love thee not. I say I love you more than he can do. If thou say so. Withdraw, and prove it too. Oh, quick, come! Lysander, where to tend all this? Away, you Ethiopian! Oh, no, no, <laughs> sir. Seem to break loose. Take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man. Go! Hang off, thou cat! Thou bird! Vile thing, let loose, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent! Why are you grown so rude? What taint is this sweet love? Thy love? Out, tawny tartar, out! <laughs> out, loathed medicine! Oh, hated potion, hence! Do you not jest? Yes, Zeus, and so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. <laughs> I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond's hold you. I'll not trust your word. What? Should I hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What? Can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me? Wherefore? What news, my love? Am not I Hermia? Are not you Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me. Yet, <laughs> since night you left me. Why then you left me? Oh, the gods forbid. In earnest shall I say. I, by my life, and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore, be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Nothing truer. Tis no jest that I hate thee and love Helena. You juggler, you canker blossom, you seed of love. What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine, it's fate. Have you no modesty? No maiden shame? No touch of bashfulness? What? Will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit! You puppet, you! Puppet? Why, so ain't! That way goes the game! Now I perceive that she had made compare between our statures, <coughs> that she had urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, she had prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in your esteem because I am so dwarfed and so low? How low am I, thou painted maple? <laughs> Speak! How low am I? I am not yet so low that but that my nails can reach unto thine eyes. So I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think because she is something lower than myself that I can match her. Lower? Hark again! Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia. Did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you. Save that in love unto Demetrius I told him of yourself and his work. He followed you, for love I followed him. But he hath chid me hence and threatened me to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. And now, so you will let me quiet go, to Athens will I bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go, you see how simple and how fond I am. Why, get you gone. Who is it that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, come enough. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. Oh, when she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she 
be but little, she is fierce. Little again. Nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to plot me thus? Get me you her. gone, you dwarf! <laughs> you minimus of hindering not trap me. You bee. You ate for it. You are too officious in her behalf to scorn your services. Let her alone. Speak not to Helena. Take not her part. If thou dost intend, never so little show of love to her. Now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darest, to try whose right of thine or mine is most in Helena. Oh, follow. Nay, I'll go with thee, cheek by jowl. You mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you, I, nor longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands and mine are quicker for a prey. My legs are longer, thou turn away! <laughs> <laughs> this ah, is ah, thy negligence! Ah, Still thou mistake, or I'll commit these knaveries willfully. Believe me, king of shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian oh. garments he hath on? And so, far painless is my enterprise, that I have anointed an Athenian's eye. And so far am I glad it so did sport. As this there jangling I seem a sport. <laughs> Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight? Like to Lysander, sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometime rail thou like Demetrius, and from each other look thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep, then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whilst I in this affair do the employ all to my Indian queen and beg of her her changeling boy. Oh, and then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view, and all things shall be peace. My fairy king, this must be done with haste. In haste, but notwithstanding, make no delay, we may affect this business yet ere day. Up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town. Goblin, lead them up and down. Here comes one. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, villain, drawn and ready, where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me then to plainer ground. My sender, speak again. Thou run away, thou coward. Art thou fled? Speak, in some bush. Where dost thou hide thy head? Follow my voice, will try no manhood here. <sighs> he goes before me, and still dares me on. Here will rest I. Come, thou gentle day. O oh, weary night, O oh, long and tedious night, Yes, for three, come one more. Two of both kinds make up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Never so in weary, never so in woe. Here will I rest me till the break of day. On the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye. Gentle lover's remedy. When thou wakes, thou takes true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known, every man shall take his own. In your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man will have his mare again, and all shall be well. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed. Well, I, thy amiable cheek, do coy, and stick musk roses in thy sleek, smooth head, and kiss thy fair, large ear, my gentle joy. Where's he, Slotham? Ready, 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 ready. Scratch my head, he, Slotham. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready, Monsieur Cobweb, good Monsieur. 
Get you your weapons in hand, and kill me a red-tipped humblebee on top of a thistle. And bring me the honey bag. Oh, do not fret yourself too much in the action, good Miss Gure, but take care that the honey bag break not. I'd be loath to have you overflow with honey. Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready! <laughs> Give me your niece, Monsieur Mustard Seed. I pray you leave your courtesy. What's your will? Nothing good, sir, uh, except to help cavalry cobweb to scratch. Yes! <laughs> I must to the barbers, monsieur, for methinks I'm marvelous hairy about the face. For I'm such a tender ass, if my face do but tickle me, I must scratch. What? Wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let us have the tongs and the bones. desire for a bottle of hay. Sweet hay, good hay hath no fellows. <laughs> I have a venturous fairy that shall sing the squirrel's horn and fetch thee new nuts. Well, truly, I'd rather have a handful or two of dried peas. But I pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have an exposition of a new to come upon. <laughs> Sleep thou, and I'll wind thee in my arms. Fairies be gone and be always away. So doth the wood bind, the sweet honey suckle, gently and swift the female eye bestow, and rings the barky fingers on the elm. Oh, how I love thee! How I dote on thee! Welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity. When I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged me my patience. I then did ask of her her Indian boy, <laughs> and her fairy gave it to me, into my bower, and straight to fairyland. And now I have the boy. And I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. And gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off this Athenian swain, and think no more of tonight's accident, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first, I will release the queen. Be thou as thou wast wont to be. See thou as thou wast wont to see. Diane's bud or Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. Now, my Titania, my sweet queen, wake you. My Oberon, what visions have I seen? Methought thou was enamored of an ass. <laughs> there lies your love. <laughs> How came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe it now! Oh, silence a while. Robin, take off his head, and Titania, music call, and sprite more that dead than all these common sleep that five the senses. Music call, music such as charmeth sleep. Now, when thou wakest, with thine own fool's eyes peep. Come, my Titania, take hand with me. And rock the ground whereon these sleepers be. To feel the rhythm of life, to feel the powerful beat, to feel the tingle in your fingers, to feel the tingle in your feet. To feel the rhythm of life, to feel the powerful beat, to feel the tingle in your fingers, to feel the tingle in your feet. Now thou and I are new in amnesty, and will tomorrow midnight dance solemnity and Duke Theseus's house triumphantly. And there shall the pair of faithful lovers be wedded with Theseus, all in jollity. My fairy king, attend and mark. I do hear the morning lark. Now, my queen, in silence sad, trip we after the night shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came to sight that I, sleeping here, was found with these mortals on the ground. This is the day Hermia must make a decision. This is the day her choice must be given. Four days past, her dad said death was her fate if she didn't accept the mistress of her mate. They flew with the law in the wood to escape, so there their love they could create. But Theseus, having all the power, made the decision of the hour, 
and overrule Permia's dad with this act, so these lovers could unite and realize their true love sight. <laughs> these things seem small and undistinguishable, like far-off mountains turn it into clouds. Methinks I see these things with parted eye when everything seems double. So methinks. And I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. It seems to me that yet we dream, we sleep. Did not you think the Duke was here and bid us follow him? Yea, and my father. And Hippolyta. And he bid us follow to the temple. Why then? <laughs> we are awake. Let us follow him. And by the way, let us recount our dream. When my next you come, call me and I will answer. My next is most fair pyramid. Hey ho! Peter Quint? Blue, the bellows mender? Snout, the tinker? Starveling? God's my life so intense it left me asleep. I've had a most rare vision. I had a dream. Past the wit of man to say what that dream was. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. Me thought I was, well, no man can tell what. Me thought I was, and me thought I had. <laughs> man is but a patched fool if he offer to say what me thought I had. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand cannot taste, nor his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write me a ballad of this dream. And it shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. I shall sing it in the latter end of the play before the Duke. Peradventure, to make it the more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Ah. Have you sent to Bottom's house? Is he come home yet? He cannot be heard of. Out of doubt he is transported. If he come not, then the play is marred. It goes not forward and off. It is not possible. You have not a man in all Athens able to discharge Pyramus, but he. No, he hath simply the best wit of any handicraft man in Athens. Yea, and the best person too. And a paramour for a sweet voice. You must say to Paragon, a paramour is, God bless us, a thing of naught. Masters, the Duke comes from the temple. And there are two or three lord and ladies more married. If we were to continue in our sport, we had all been made men. Oh, sweet Bully Bottom, the happy love he spent the day during his life. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Oh, oh Bottom! <laughs> Almost courageous day! Almost happy hour! Masters, I must discourse wonders. But ask not what, for if I tell you I am no true Athenian. I will tell you everything I could tell him. Let us hear, sweet bottom. Not a word. All I will tell you is that the Duke hath died. Get your apparel together. New strings to your beard, new ribbons to your pump. Meet presently at the palace, and every man look or his part. For the long and the short is, our play is preferred. <laughs> no more words. Go away. Go. Away. Go. <laughs> antic fables, nor these fairy toys. Such brains have such gaping fantasies, lovers and madmen. But lovers, the lunatic, and the poet are of imagination all compact. Such trick has such strong imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy, then it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? But all the story of the night told over and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesses than fancy's images engrossed to something of a great constancy, but how so ever strange and admirable. Here come the lovers, full of more mirth and joy. A joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your heart. More than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Oh, come now, what masks? 
What dances shall we have to ease the anguish of this torturing hour? A play there is our mirth of manager. What revels are at hand? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long. Yeah. Oh, what are he that do play it? Uh, Hard-handed men that work in London here. And we will hear that play. I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Let him in, and to their places. I love to see not wretchedness overcharged and duty in his service perishing. My gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. Uh, he says they can do nothing in this kind. So please, your grace, the prologue is addressed. Let him approach. <clears throat> If we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will to show our simple skill that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then we come but in despite. We, we do not come as minding to content you, our true intent is. All for your delight, we are not here that you should hear repent you. The actors are at hand. And by their show, you shall know all that you are like to know. His speech was like a tangled chain, all disordered and nothing impaired. Who is next? Gentles, perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on to truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lady of Thisbe is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall, which did these lovers sunder, and through walls chink, poor souls, they're content to whisper, at the which let no man wonder. This man, with lantern, dog, and bush of thorn, presenteth moonshine. For, if you will know, by moonshine did these lovers think no score to meet at Ninus's tomb there, there to woo. This grisly beast, which lion height by name, the trusty Thisbe, coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright. And as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion, vile with bloody mouth, did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty Thisbe's mantle slain. Whereat, with blade, with bloody, blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling, bloody breast. And this be tarrying in mulberry shade, his jagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion, moonshine, wall, and lovers flame at large discourse, while here they do remain. I wonder if the lion be to speak. <laughs> In this same interlude, it doth befall that I, one snout by name, do present a wall. In this same wall, as I would have you think, can it in a crannied hole or chink, through which the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, did often whisper very secretly. This loam, this rough cast, and this stone doth show that I am the same wall. The truth is so. This the cranny is, right to the sinister, through which the lovers are to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? Silence! Pyramus draws near the wall. Oh, grim looks night. Oh, night with hue so black. Oh, night, whichever art one day is not. Oh, night. Oh, night. Alack, 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 I fear this these promises forgot. And thou, a wall. Thou sweet and lovely wall that parts her father's ground and mine. Thou wall. Thou sweet and lovely wall, show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. <laughs> Thanks, courteous wall, Jove shields thee for this. <laughs> but what see I? No, this be do I see. Oh, with wall, through which I see noblest, cursed be thy stones for thus deceiving me. The wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again. No, he should not. Deceiving me is this beast's view. She is to uh, enter, and I am to fire through the hole in the wall. It will all fall pad, as I told you. Yonder she comes. Oh, wall! So often hast thou heard my moan. For part thee, my fair pyramids, and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stone. 
thy stones with lime and pareness of the moon. I see a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe say, Thisbe, my love thou art, and my love I think, think what thou wilt. I am thy lover's grace, and like Lamander and Crusty Steel, and I like Helen to the baits me kill. Not shaftless to progress was so true, as shaftless to progress I to you. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. <laughs> I kiss the wall's hole, not your lips at all. Well, don't give me any pills straight away. Tide life, tide death, I come without delay. Thus have I my part discharged so, and being done, wall away, doth go. <laughs> this is the silliest stuff that e'er I heard. The worst are no worse if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination, then, and not theirs. But the best in this kind are but shadows. If we imagine them no worse than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Oh, here comes two noble beasts in, a man and a lion. You ladies, you, whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor, may now perchance Oh, quick, and tremble here, when a lion, rough in the wildest rage, doth roar. Well, then know that I, one snug the joiner, am a lion fell, nor else no lion stand. For if I should as lion come and strike into this place, twere pity on my life. <laughs> he is a gentle beast, and of a good conscience. This lantern doth the horned moon present. Uh, he is no circumference, and his horns are invisible. This lantern doth the horned moon present, like my, myself, the man the moon doth seem to be. Why, this is the greatest error of all the rest. How is it that the man is moon, the man should be put into the lantern? I am wary of this moon, what he would change. It seems by his small light of description that he is in the wane, but yet in courtesy, in reason, we must stay the time. Proceed, Moon. All I have to say is to say that this lantern is the moon, I the man in the moon, this thornbush, my thornbush, and this dog, my dog. Why, all these things should be put into the lantern, for they are in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but silence, but silence. Here comes Thisbe. This is old Ninny's tomb. Where is my love? <laughs> well roar thy well roared this is well shown, moon. Truly the moon shines with the good grace. <laughs> well mouth lion. <laughs> Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, moon, for always shining so bright, for thy gracious golden glittering gleams, the taste of fruit is beside. But say, no spite, but mark, for night what dreadful dole is here. Eyes, do you see? What can it be? Thy mantle good was stained with blood. Approach, you furies fell. Come, come, cut thread and thrum. Quail, crush, conclude, and quell. This passion and death of a gentle friend would go near to make a man look sad. Beshrew my heart, but I pity the man. Wherefore nature did sell lion's frame, since vile lion hath here deflowered my dear, which is, no, no, uh, which was the fairest dame that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer. Come, tears confound out, sword and wound, the pap of Pyramus. I, that left pap where heart doth hop, thus die I. Thus, thus, thus. Now I'm dead, now I'm fled. My soul is in the sky, my tongue to the light. Moon, take thy flight. Now die, 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 die. <laughs> How chance moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back to find her lover? She will find him by starlight. Oh, oh, and here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Methinks she should not use a long one for such a pyramus. I hope she will be brief. <laughs> Asleep, my love. What said my dove? Oh, pyramus, arise! Speak! Speak! Quite dumb. Dead! Dead! Tongue, not a word. Um, trusty sword. 
come play my breast and brew. <coughs> and farewell, friends. <laughs> Thus is the end. Adieu. Adieu. <laughs> Moonshine and Lion are left to bury the dead. And Wall, too. No, the wall that parted their father frowned us out. Um, would it please you to see our epilogue or a Bergamax dance between two of our company? <laughs> no, no epilogue, I pray thee. Uh, but come, your Bergamax, let your epilogue alone. Your play needs no excuse. Oh. The iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve lovers to bed, sweet friends to bed. A fortnight hold we this solemnity and nightly revels. Now the hungry lion roars while the wolf beholds the moon, whilst the heavy plowman snores. All weary tasks are done. Now our frolic, not a mouse shall disturb the hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Through this house give glimmering light by dead in drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite hop as bird from bird from briar. And this ditty after me sing and dance it trippingly. First rehearse this song by rolls, then each word a warbling note. Hand in hand in fairy grace will we sing and bless this place. The if we shadows have offended, we'll think with this. And all is mended. Well, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Oh, gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest buck, if we have unearned luck now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar called. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. Will we sing and bless this place? <laughs> <laughs> Tingle in your feet. A midsummer night's dream. <laughs>